Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I was walking over from the house. And, uh, boy, the, the buzzing in here was really, <laughs> really upbeat. So it's nice to have the windows open, a cool, beautiful day, and you made it here. <laughs> so hopefully the detours were not overly burdensome, and we may still have people coming in for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, so, but it started, it's underway. They talked about a, a footbridge, but I don't know if that is in yet. It is. And I don't know if it's big enough for any kind of a meal. Okay, so it's not very big. So, glad you're here today. I want to start off just by thanking uh, St. Luke's congregation for the wonderful service that they held last week. Um, it was very inspirational for me and my entire family uh, to be here, to be a part of that, and uh, the fellowship that we enjoyed and the friendship, it was uh, something that our families would talk about for at least the next 40 years. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be around, but <laughs> we'll talk about it a lot. Our worship service this morning is based on page 45 and our opening hymn, Glory Be to God the Father, 239 in the hymnal. Thank you. 
Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 78 in the front of the hymnal. Kind of just see what page that is on. 95, thank you. Psalm 78, page 95. chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. We have a very challenging section to just listen to because we have uh, a priest from the northern kingdom of Israel who is not faithful to the one true God, nor is the king of the king of Israel. Uh, and Amos, the prophet from Judah, is having a message for them. So it's kind of going back and forth. Amos is the good guy. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to endure all of his words. This is what Amos says. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go into exile away from its own soil. Then Amaziah said to Amos, You seer, get out of here. Flee to the land of Judah. You may eat food and prophesy there, but you must never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the sanctuary of the king and the national temple. Then Amos responded to Amaziah, I was not a prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. Rather, I was a sheep breeder, and I took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending flocks, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. But now, hear the word of the Lord, you who are saying, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. This is what the Lord says. Your wife will be a prostitute in the city and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled out with a measuring line. And 
as for you, you will die upon unclean soil, and Israel will certainly go into exile far away from its own soil. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson for today is recorded in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And here's what Paul writes. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to become an overseer, he desires a noble task. It is necessary then for the overseer to be above reproach, the husband of only one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not a violent man, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. It is necessary that he manage his own household well, with all dignity, making sure that his children obey him. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he might become conceited and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In addition, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he may not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Here ends our epistle lesson. We'll continue with the seasonal response. Alleluia. The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. Alleluia. Please stand for our gospel lesson. The Holy, Go Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their money belts. They were to put on sandals, but not to wear two coats. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that area. Any place that will not receive you or listen to you as you leave there, shake off the dust that is under your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They also drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Here ends our gospel lesson. The congregation may be seated for our next hymn. We'll join now in singing hymn number 524, O Fount of God, a fount of good for all your love. 524. <laughs>
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Word of God that we're focusing on today is a continuation in the book of Philippians. Um, about four weeks ago, I had done the very beginning verses of Philippians chapter 1, and today I'm going to continue on with Philippians 1, starting verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that the things which have happened to me actually took place to advance the gospel. And so it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to all the rest that I am in chains because of Christ. And through my change, chains, the majority of my brothers in the Lord have become much more confident about daring to speak the word of God fearlessly. Some preach Christ out of envy and rightly, and others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am placed here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking they can cause trouble for me while I am in chains. What does it matter? Only this, that in every way, whether for outward appearance or for truth, Christ is being proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice because I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the support of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. This matches my earnest expectation, and I hope that I will in no way be put to shame, but with all boldness, boldness as always, even so now, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Yes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am going to go on living in the flesh, that will be fruitful labor for me. Yet which should I prefer? I do not know. I am pulled in two directions because I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for your sake that I remain in the flesh. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. And so by my coming to you again, my goal is to give you even more reasons to boast in Christ Jesus. These are God's words. Well, dear Christian friends, as, um, we just began going through this book of Philippians. I'm going to be doing different sections throughout the rest of 2022, um, about once every three Sundays. And as we go through this very personal book, we see a tremendous message of joy. And a few weeks ago, when I did the very beginning, it was all about Paul's prayer for the Philippians. And in that prayer, he was so encouraged that he had a congregation that was backing him in the proclamation of the gospel, and, and he was just happy that he had that special relationship with them. And now as we go forward, we're letting or giving him a chance to tell them a little bit more about his personal situation. They knew that he's a prisoner. They knew that he was in chains. And the question that was probably at the very top of their minds is, are you going to get out of this alive? And how are you doing as you're going through this? And so he's going to talk about that. And his words of encouragement are going to be words of encouragement for all of us because his focus will be to, to magnify Christ. To put Christ in the spotlight and keep him there. And it's not about him. It's going to be about Christ. And that was kind of what Marcus uh, was talking about last week in the sermon when he was talking about Moses. That, you know, it, it's not Moses, but it was God who was doing all of this. And now we have another one of his faithful servants, Paul, who's reiterating that same message. Now Marcus did his, and now it's mine for this one out of Philippians. How's he doing? He's taking being chained in the best.
best possible way. He is confident that God will work this out for good. And in Romans chapter 8, he will write more about that to the congregation at Rome when he tells them, you know, I know, we know that in all things God works together for good for the, those who for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So he's getting that whole experience of seeing how God can make challenging situations that have the potential for execution. A blessing. And work out for good. Paul will be released from chains in Rome after this imprisonment because he eventually will go to trial and the court will realize there was no reason that you ever should have been a prisoner at all. You're totally free. It's a religious situation. We're not going to get involved in that. Go on your way. Do what you want. So he'll be released. But he doesn't know that yet. And it's already been over two years since he's been a prisoner. And now in Rome, he's not just a prisoner. He's in the barracks of all of the guards. And he has a guard chained to him 24 hours a day. And the only time that changes is when a new shift comes on and the next guard takes his place. Paul stays, guards change. Again, Paul remains very positive, very optimistic of realizing that this, the Lord, is turning into a blessing. And he starts out with the people that are immediately around him, the Roman guards. The guards have gotten to know him. They talk, they visit. Paul shares about Jesus. Paul shares why he is being held as a prisoner. And all of it goes back to his relationship with Jesus Christ. And they begin to see very clearly that this is not a hardened criminal that's going to be a danger to society. This is a God-fearing, Christ-fearing believer of the one true God whose only goal and ambition is to share the good news of salvation. And he shares it with them. And people come to learn about Jesus. They come to believe in Jesus. There will be different occasions in the end of the book of Romans where people mention uh, some of these different individuals by name. And we know that people did convert. So that's his first group. The ones that he's closest to. Chained to. He's talking to them. He's sharing with them. And they're hearing the good news of salvation. Now, I think what it would be like to be chained to someone who's telling you about Jesus. It, it, it might be scary. <laughs> because we're not used to being so closely connected to Jesus full time. We know he lives within us with the Holy Spirit. We know that he's always with us because he is Almighty God and he is present everywhere. And yet sometimes we don't always think about how close God is to each and every one of us to be involved in all of our conversations and in all of our actions. And that can be a little bit of a a scary thing to remember. And yet that is the God who came to relieve us from those fears, a God who already knows all of our sins and who still loves us and has still forgiven us and has still promised to be always with us. Well, these guards are having a special opportunity. The city of Rome, through these guards, through other Christians in Rome are also hearing about this unique prisoner. There have been Christians in Rome already. 
Many of them had fled because of persecution in Jerusalem and had gone to different areas throughout the uh, region there. And Paul had been making connections with them and he will be writing a letter to them. And these Christians who were facing some persecution for being a non-Roman God-believing individual were now strengthened to realize Paul's chained to Roman guards, and he's not scared to talk about his faith, and he's not scared that death could be at the very end of that imprisonment, and they were encouraged, they were emboldened, they had the, the joy and the love of their Savior, have an opportunity to grow in their hearts. And they continue to share the good news of salvation. Later on, there will be terrible persecutions in Rome. And Christians will die. And that's something that's been recorded in Roman history and that people are very familiar with, that they will be thrown in to be eaten by lions, they will be killed in all kinds of uh, terrible, torturous ways, and yet the Lord worked through all of those things that are coming in the future to really strengthen the Christian church in the worst of situations. Through the blood of the martyrs, the church grew, and it continued to grow. They were driven down into the catacombs of Rome. Hasn't taken place yet, but they will be driven down into the catacombs to be able to freely, secretly worship. And we will have many Christian symbols that will be found in those catacombs that will help direct people to find fellow believers. The sign of the fish will be one of those. And in the sign of the fish, the very name for the uh, Greek word for fish itself, when it is used as an anacronym, it's Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So the name of the fish had a totally Christian important message. And the crosses, the signs of the cross, those were made down there, and other Christian symbols that archaeologists still find even today as they continue their searches and their digging, they see that Christianity was alive and growing and eventually taking over because Emperor Constantine would convert and he would become a Christian. All of a sudden Christianity in the hundreds of years that will follow this would become the favored religion People converted. The early Christian church grows in Rome after all this persecution. So Paul is having an important part of it, this small beginning. And so as he writes back to the people, he's encouraging them that it's working with the Roman guards, it's working with the Roman believers who are transplanted and coming to Rome. It is continuing to work and now as he writes back to that congregation in Philippi, he wants to make sure that they are also strengthened because Philippi is a Roman city and they face many of the same challenges that the people in Rome living in because they have so many transplant people from Rome who are living in this city. And they need to be encouraged for their persecution, for their challenges for just you know, the difficulties of life and the opportunities to serve their Savior Jesus. So Paul sees this, as, sees this as a beautiful opportunity to magnify Christ. Let's not talk about me and my problems. Let's talk about Jesus and see what he's doing through all of these problems. And I'm confident, Paul is confident God's going to work this out. He talks about his deliverance. He talks about his hopes, his prayers, his thoughts of eventually being able to come back to visit the congregation at Philippi and 
that as he does that, he also has some very special words that are important for Christians of all times. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I am going to go on living in the flesh, that will mean faithful labor for me. Yet which should I prefer? I don't know. I'm pulled in two directions because I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for your sake that I remain in the flesh. And since I'm convinced of this, I know I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. What a beautiful way that he has of putting down into words the thoughts of every Christian. We love being here in this world. But we look forward to being out of this sinful world with all of its disease, with all of its problems, uh, with, with death all around us, and to be reunited with saints and believers, loved ones who have already gone ahead of us, who are in heaven already and are waiting for that day of the resurrection of all flesh, the reuniting of the body and the soul, and the reuniting of God's family that will be spending eternity in heaven. And that's what we think about. We don't think about it as much as we should when we're younger, but as we grow older, that becomes more and more of a thought that where, where would I rather be? Heaven or here on earth? We love the Pickwick Valley, but heaven's going to be better. And when God calls us there, that will be a joyful time for us to be in God's kingdom. So he's looking at this in a very logical way, a way that makes a lot of sense. If I get to go to be in heaven, perfect. My work here will be done. But if I get to stay, I get to still work for Jesus. When I get to heaven, there aren't going to be any people to um, to be people to become believers because everyone who is there already is a believer. And so we will not have to be gospel ambassadors for people who are already part of that will be preaching to the choir. And God's going to put all of us into the choir. But while we're here, we've got a lot of work that still needs to be done. Still needs to be done for ourselves to grow in our faith and then as we grow in our faith, we continue to look for those opportunities to share our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul writes about here at the very end, just to remind, I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. And the goal, give us even more reason to boast in Christ Jesus. That's our purpose for us who are still here, to keep on living our lives as Christians, keep on being the light of the world and letting that gospel light shine, keep on looking for those opportunities to share Jesus Christ in every possible way, keep on through our offerings and through our prayers, supporting the work of our missionaries, both in the area and abroad, to, so that many more uh, pastors and missionaries and teachers can be available to help continue to carry out that work. Our Senate wants to start you know, those 100 missions in 10 years, and year number one is already done. And I think they've started eight so far in year 2022, and keep on working as they go forward and remembering our missionaries in those far off countries that we do support. Brazil, the Apache mission. We think of any other missions that we support through our mission offerings that go to our synod. And that work is such that continues to be carried out 
for training as well as ministry. And we ask that the Lord would constantly keep our hearts happy and joyful for the sake of being here and working for Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn. It is going to be hymn number 394. Call to be merciful and hear my prayer. God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. 
Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. as a thrilling sound. this morning. Uh, please don't forget to sign our guest register and come back to worship with us again, no matter which side of the bridge that you come from. 